number of years ago, an inscription was placed above the entranceway to several of our buildings. It bears the familiar words, science with practice. From that beginning, Iowa State University has developed its present orientation toward research. University research is a natural development. Particularly at the higher levels of learning, we seek to go beyond the present frontiers of knowledge. We can no longer learn from others, so we must ask questions and learn from nature herself. Research. It has a major role in university education. Consider the three major functions of our university. The first and most familiar of the three is the on-campus teaching of students. The second, also familiar, is extension. But the third, research, is often found where a few pass by. The casual observer recalls another inscription over an entrance way when he hears of the Institute for Atomic Research or the Ames Laboratory of the Atomic Energy Commission. He's not apt to bring to mind the facilities that make this, by any measure, the largest concerted research effort in Iowa. The same casual observer may think of a complex of sheds, pens, and silos as a lush, befeeding layout, not as a research establishment. And he thinks of the greenhouse as a place to grow flowers, not as a botanical research area. They know Iowa's Veterinary Medical Research Institute is on a hill out on South Beach, but may never know of the cobalt irradiator which is installed there. They know the National Animal Disease Laboratory is not a part of the university, but it is, nevertheless, a part of the Ames Research Community. Or they may know there's a computation center, a first-order service to researchers everywhere on campus, but they may not be able to tell you where it's located extensive research, intensive research, research that is tightly interwoven with both teaching and extension. It's here, even if we don't meet it face to face on the campus walks. We all recognize the value of research to our economy, our health, and our welfare. University research, like any other, seeks to extend these benefits. Sometimes, particularly in the case of applied research, the contribution is clear to everyone. Floor tiles made from concrete, which in turn is made from furfural, which in turn can be made from corn cobs. No, this isn't the same corn board that was developed earlier. It's new, dense, shows promise. Now, contrast this applied research with basic research. In this case, the study of tracks made in a hydrogen-filled bubble chamber when an accelerated antiproton strikes a proton of hydrogen. Knowledge for its own sake. No application is evident at the time of the discovery. But in the future, this information could have far-reaching results. Well, we know what research can do for us. But there's one element of university research that sets it apart. This unique element develops from the needs of the graduate student. To understand this relationship between research and the graduate student, let's turn to an example. Dr. David Cox works with Iowa State's Swine Radiation Project. It's a big project with major facilities on the 250-acre Billsland Memorial Farm near Madrid, and it has its own office building right here on campus. On the project staff, Andreessen, Baker, Hazel, Lush, and Vogt. This group has developed the research design their object is to gain a more complete understanding of the genetic effects of radiation on living things. In this case, they'll study the genetic effects of radiation on pigs. Pigs because of their size. Radiation effects on small laboratory animals like mice or guinea pigs may be quite different from those on a larger animal. Yes, pigs. Because of their physiology and what we already know about their genetic patterns through our work in breeding. What happens when some of the males are given measured doses of radiation? Later, what will be observed in the evaluation of the progeny? 
Here the research design takes two directions. First, the study of some traits which are controlled by single genes. These results are evaluated in terms of the resulting blood groups, characteristics known to be controlled by single genes. The second direction of the research design involves the study of characteristics controlled by many genes. Good evidence as to how this is working here at Iowa State. Over 400 graduate students have research activities which are administered by the Agricultural and Home Economics Experiment Station. The Hatch Act funds, both regional and state allocations, contribute here, but Iowa itself must support about half of the work going on. In metallurgy, the work is supported federally through the Ames Laboratory of the Atomic Energy Commission. 225 graduate students are on the rolls of the Ames Laboratory, and another 60 undergraduates are employed in research-related activities. In electrical engineering, Dr. Palm and his students are at work with thin magnetic film. This material has tremendous potential for improving the capabilities of computers. This research is administered by the Engineering Research Station. Funds for this type of research are available from industry, but for the engineering research station to support 90 to 100 graduate students, about a third of the funds must come from the state. Another source of support for research activities anywhere on the campus is the Iowa State Research Foundation. Attorney and engineer Dan Griffin, who serves as the secretary manager, is understandably pleased with the contributions which this organization has been able to make. Another vital contribution of the Research Foundation is its work on patents. But research does not confine itself to established centers. The search for new knowledge must remain campus-wide. In the late 1940s, Dr. Carr of the Physics Department set up the first electron microscope at Iowa State. Ten years later, Dr. Bowen, working with this same instrument, was able to attract attention to the need for such instruments in the life sciences. By a combination of university and grant money, two additional electron microscopes were brought to the campus. Today, there are seven electron microscopes. Dr. Ross Microscopy Laboratory alone provides ten graduate students with facilities. In turn, the availability of these instruments and the associated equipment, plus proficiency on the part of the staff who must direct and guide their use, make it possible to attract other grant money for specific research projects. As these grants become realities, Graduate students are able to engage in research in the area outlined by the supporting grant. Now, it would be wrong to assume that research is set up simply to subsidize graduate study. That would be inconsistent with what must always be the prime concern of research, that of extending the frontiers of our knowledge. University research, like any other, must be set up for the sake of research itself, not for the graduate student. With this requirement, the man who seeks out the new knowledge is the key individual. In the case of the university, this key individual is the professor. It's his inquiry, his personal interest, that launches and guides new research projects. It may start, as with Dr. Gardner, as just an idea. He wonders whether isolating a child in a room with mirrors will give us any new information about the child's development of a concept of self. Can he build from this idea? Can he design research which will give us some new insights? Observation through one-way mirrors. It's still in an idea stage, not yet ready to seek funds for supporting the work. In some cases, professors must push ahead on their research in an independent fashion. One result of Dr. Feinberg's research is the published book, The Satirist. His research involves studying in depth the satire existing in our literature. 
studying the satirists themselves as revealed in biographies, studying psychology for clues as to the motivations for satire, and studying contemporary satire by listening and looking. But his inquiry continues. Now Dr. Feinberg is at work on the second book, Humor and Satire. In other cases, research needs financial assistance in order to get underway. Dr. Bryan had noticed recent reports in the literature on leukemia, which suggested that chemical differences accompanied morphological changes to a neoplastic condition. These changes were further characterized by oversized chromosomes. He had two breeding stocks of mice, one with high susceptibility for leukemia, another with low susceptibility. Dr. Bryan was ready to push on needed help, needed funds. In this case, seed money came from a rather unusual source. A group of citizens at Anamosa, Iowa, wanted to do something for research. Research in the fight against cancer. As the competence of both the students and the staff increases, and if the research seems at all promising, it may be possible to obtain more extensive support. However, such a stage might never have been reached without the seed money. When everything works right, we may end up with a complex, which we call a facility. Now, this is not just a building or a building full of equipment, although both are necessary. A facility is the combination of these, together with a staff which has proved its ability to do research in a given area, and the graduate students who man many of the important stations involved in the research. In addition, a research facility must have the services of the university itself, the computer centers, the instrument shops, and the irradiation chambers. As one example of a research facility, we might look at the biomedical engineering laboratory. Recent work at this laboratory has developed a respiratory augmentation mechanism for use in hospitals. It is a mechanical aid for those unfortunate infants who have respiratory problems at birth. One of the unique features of this device is the way it's engineered to respond to the attempts of the infant to breathe. A sensing device placed in the baby's nostril is capable of detecting even feeble attempts to draw breath. This feeble signal is amplified and provides a triggering mechanism which starts the respirator pumping air into the infant. Thus, the baby himself controls the respirator. Dr. Chalvin is heading another project in the Biomedical Engineering Laboratory, a project to fabricate and evaluate an artificial heart. Again, those on the project are faced with a sensing problem, which centers about the fact that a normal heart pumps blood at varying rates. These rates are in response to the variation in the needs of the body. The problem, then, is to determine how to sense this requirement for blood and, in turn, feed that information back into the control system of the artificial heart. As you can see, this involves a cross-disciplinary approach. They will need people who understand medicine and veterinary medicine, others who have backgrounds in electrical engineering, still others who have backgrounds in programming computers. This cross-disciplinary approach, the availability of professionals in these many areas, is another advantage of university research. This whole activity started with seed money, with people, with ideas. It's now getting support from the university and from the Iowa Heart Association. When a research facility develops, it's indeed a precious thing, an institution in and of its own which may be of untold value. This then is the unique thing about university research. Research is carried on, research facilities are built up, and the big bonus is that we provide our students with research experience. In 1962, the Office of Vice President for Research was created and assigned to the Dean of the Graduate College. This action placed research and the programs for new researchers under the same administrator. 